Okay, shall we start? I'm just going to say a few words. <coughs> hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Clive Chandler from the Department of Classics here at UCT. The Department of Classics is in the School of Language and Literature. Uh, Professor Chandler is held originally from, uh, educated in Britain and Zimbabwe and South Africa. He has a PhD from UCT and is currently professor, as I said, in the Department of Classics. His research interests include ancient philosophy and rhetoric, madness in antiquity, and Philodemus. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I just want to test the, uh, the microphone, whether it's picking up my voice. Can everybody hear me at the back, or is it not so good? It's all right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for turning out um, this afternoon, and I hope for the future afternoons at half past three. It's a fairly civilized hour. Uh, we won't be afflicted by the god who um, attacks people at midday, the god Pan, makes you feel very, very sleepy, uh, jumps on your back. So hopefully we'll be rid of him. Um, and um, in this course, as you would have already guessed um, from looking at the description, what we plan to do is give you an introduction to some of the concepts of uh, divinity as they are um, illustrated by, by ancient Greek philosophy. We obviously can't cover all schools of ancient Greek philosophy. There are many of them, so we've selected a few. Today's lecture is going to really be, as you can see, about Greek gods before philosophy. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to move on to the so-called pre-Socratic philosophers, the philosophers before Socrates, and then on to Socrates and Plato on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday you'll be treated to a lecture by an expert on Aristotle, that's Professor uh, Dr. Tom Anger from the philosophy department, who's uh, co um, convening this course with me, and then I'll come back on Friday for our last lecture, which will look at the Stoic and Epicurean concepts of divinity. Um, this current lecture, Greek Gods Before Philosophy, is not meant to uh, imply by any means that uh, we're talking about a period when people didn't think about the gods, uh, that people didn't question the gods in any form at all. So uh, what I'm trying to do today is just lay the groundwork in what is actually quite a complex picture. Uh, my broad historical parameters here are really from roughly the time of our first available texts in ancient Greek literature, and I'll be looking uh, primarily at the Theogony of Hesiod, but also of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Many of you have probably um, read them or bits of them or about them before in this course, so I won't go into too much detail about those texts, but I'll extract from those texts some snippets of information which I believe are very, very interesting in filling out a picture of what people in this period thought about the gods. I think an appropriate place to start is an author whose name is Pindar. He comes in the first half of the 5th century BC, so he's roughly sort of uh, performing his poems and composing his poems in the period between 500 and 450 BC. And Pindar is a, a very, very useful person to start with because he's a poet who is commissioned by uh, people who are successful in the various athletic contests and games throughout the Greek-speaking world in this time, he's commissioned to compose poems of celebration of their victories. So he's composing poems for people all over the Greek-speaking world. In that sense, then, he's very much somebody who has to be attuned to an international audience, to an international clientele. And that's why I think he's so useful, because what he says about the gods, for example, might be taken to have some kind of international relevance for ancient Greek-speaking people. Remember always that the ancient Greeks are not a single nation state in this period. They are, in fact, a diaspora culture. They spread throughout the Mediterranean and even to the shores of the land surrounding the Black Sea. So they're, they're very widely dispersed. 
And that's one of our problems when we're trying to get to grips with what these Greeks thought about the gods. Because we have to ask the question, which Greeks are we talking about? Are we talking about them collectively? Is it possible to talk about them collectively? Or are we talking about specific places? And unfortunately, our evidence is very often um, sort of limited to specific places. Places like Athens, for example, come to mind immediately. Athens is overrepresented in many ways, um, as opposed to other Greek settlements. So let's look at this one. Pindar says something that looks very, very um, uh, straightforward, very, 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 very definite and certain. He says there is one race, he uses the word genos in Greek, of men and one race of gods. Both have breath of life from a single mother. Some of you might already know or guess who that single mother is. It is, if you know a little bit about Greek mythology, ultimately the goddess Gaia, Earth. But, he says, sundered power holds us divided, so that the one is nothing, you can guess who that is, <laughs> while for the other, the brazen sky is established, their sure citadel forever. Those, of course, must be the gods. Yet, he says, we have some likeness in great intelligence, noos in Greek, or strength, he uses the word physis there, to the immortals. Though we know not what the day will bring, what course after nightfall, destiny, potmos, the word in Greek, has written that we must run to the end. Now this quotation, I think, will be useful to bear in mind because in some ways, either explicitly or implicitly, I think we'll be returning to some of the assumptions in this quotation, running through an awful lot of ancient Greek philosophical thinking subsequently. Even though this is not, strictly speaking, a philosophical text, Pindar is beginning a song of celebration for an athlete who has won a victory. And as you might guess, the athlete in question then in some way, perhaps, resembles the immortals through his great physical abilities, his strength in this particular instance. So humans can be like the gods in some limited way, but they, of course, are different from them because we live in a different place, we die, very importantly, and then in those final two lines, there's a restriction in our knowledge. This is fundamental to the... Uh, ancient Greek view about the distinction between humans and gods. But in many other respects, of course, when you look initially at the Greek gods as normal 21st century people, we tend to think that there's not an awful lot that seems to separate them. I've chosen entirely at random, I must admit, an image here of a statuette, a figurine, which was recovered from a temple sanctuary on the island of Cyprus. And in the museum for that sanctuary, as you can see from the photograph, very helpfully, I don't know if you can just see it, but the curators have put on a plinth, Apollo. <laughs> now, they presumably said Apollo because this is a male figure statue, naked, and it was found in the sanctuary of Apollo and therefore presumably is Apollo. But most modern scholars actually don't believe that. On the basis of its, of its artistic um, uh, style and also the, the particular configuration of and the posture of this figure, and the way it resembles so many others, most people think this is just a normal person. It's a votive statue. It's a figurine of a male, typical from um, the archaic period. So in fact, it probably is a human, a mortal, not an immortal. But how could you tell that? You can, of course, tell when it is Apollo, because although it may look like a male, um, a rather sort of slightly androgynous male, perhaps, in this particular figure. This is a Roman copy of an earlier Hellenistic period uh, statue, roughly from about 200 BC. But we can now see that this is Apollo because, of course, we have some of the accoutrements that are part of the iconography of Apollo. We have, famously, the kithara. That's the, the sort of um, string instrument, this kind of lyre-like instrument associated with the god of music, Apollo. We also, of course, have, you can just make it out here, the um, quiver that holds his, uh, his arrows. He is the archer god. And, of course, we have this serpent curved around this. In this instance, probably representing the serpent Puthon, 
the large snake that he killed at the site of the oracular center, Delphi. So quite often we need some help in deciding whether a particular representation is a human, a normal human like you and me or an ancient Greek, or whether it be a god. So again, if we look at a very old statue like this, this lovely bronze of Zeus from Corinth, about 530 BC, we can tell it's Zeus and not some normal, ordinary person because of the figures of thunderbolt and lightning that are associated with this particular god. So too, the goddess Athena. This is not a woman with a helmet on, a normal woman with a helmet on. This presumably is the figure of Athena Promachos. Um, Athena, the one who fights in front. This is from Sicily, actually, from a Greek community at Himera. Again, you can see a very early archaic statue. So we often need help. In this representation of Athena and Poseidon by the famous Amasis painter, it's a lovely black figure vase, we are helped in many ways. We are helped as um, onlookers by the fact that Athena has the aegis, which she wears, which she inherits from her father Zeus. She has a spear, she has, of course, a helmet. Otherwise, she's like any other Athenian woman. And Poseidon, too. Notice the trident. The vase painter has also very helpfully <laughs> given us the names. Poseidon and Athenaia. And we're told, in fact, that Amasis mepoiesen, Amasis made or painted me. Right? So the, the painter has actually given his, his own authorship there. So the gods then in many ways resemble us um, in ways which make it almost impossible to tell the difference unless we have some help. So here too we find many scenes where the gods are doing the kinds of things that people normally do. It's a lovely depiction in a, um, a red figure, attic red figure, Kulix, which is a, a drinking cup. Uh, inside the Kulix, inside the drinking cup, when you drank through and you sort of saw got to the bottom, this is what you see. And there might be some sort of purpose to this. We see the god Pluton, uh, who is the god, another word, of course, for the god Hades, and his consort Persephone, the goddess of the dead, feasting like a normal married couple in Athens. And we have other normal married couples on the outside of this Kulix. We have the Olympians feasting. We have, as you can see there perhaps, and we can recognize him because of his trident, Poseidon. We have Zeus. This figure here we get to know, if we know enough about mythology, is Ganymede. And other Olympians uh, similarly. Um, this figure here identified interestingly as, as Ares. And here we have Dionysus with his ivy crown. So the iconography is very, very important. We notice that even those figures who used to be human that become gods, because one of the interesting things about Greek religion is that these divisions are slightly permeable, at least in the past. So we have the figure of Heracles here reclining in a sort of celebratory feast of his elevation to divinity um, when he enters Mount Olympus and becomes one of the Olympians. Uh, attended to, oops, sorry, attended to by um, the figure of Athena over here and, of course, the figure of Hermes. So God's feasting, God's taking pleasure in the feast in the same way that humans do. God's do the kinds of things that humans do. So they are anthropomorphic in many, many ways, not just in shape, and those issues of shape we'll come into in a moment, but... Also in other ways, their feelings, their emotions are recognizably human. They uh, feel annoyance, they feel jealousy, they feel love, they feel hatred. Um, they have brothers and sisters and parents and grandparents and very often children. They sometimes even have childhoods. So they have life stories to a certain extent. They have obligations. They have very importantly relationships. Now, we mention this because one of the things that we, get, we gather very, very soon if you're studying ancient Greek gods um, is the fact that several of these gods seem to be almost personifications, don't they? 
Um, there was a very, very popular line of inquiry in the 19th century, particularly in Germany, which tried to account for the Greek gods in terms entirely of, of nature, that the gods were originally nature gods, and that they then became gradually anthropomorphized. Uh, they evolved into anthropomorphic entities. And you might think that that, that sort of view has a certain um, plausibility. But we notice that even figures such as the Kuklopes, the Cyclops, who have names that mean things that are not human. So, for example, the names of these Kuklopes who make the thunderbolts for Zeus are Brontes, thunder, Steropes, lightning, Arges, flash. But notice that even much later, uh, this lovely 2nd century AD mosaic from uh, Thuga in Tunisia um, represents these kuklopes very much as normal humans working in a forge. That's how they seem to be imagined. They're not imagined in another way. Here's another representation of them. I know it's a bit sort of blurry, but it's a, um, a rather eroded Pompeian painting now in the museum at Na National Museum in Naples. So once again, you see them at the forge. And then those other things that we learn about in the various texts, gods like Hypnos, sleep, Thanatos, death, those are also, when they are represented, represented in anthropomorphic form. In this instance, this wonderful um, depiction of the um, conveying of the figure of Sarpedon, we're going to come back to him actually a little bit later, he's attended when he's lifted from the battlefield um, uh, in, in Troy, um, this scene is in fact represented, a representation of something in the Iliad. We see the representation of, in this case, Thanatos. You can see his name. He's labeled, helpfully, Thanatos. And his brother, Hupnos, sleep. They're represented as warriors. The only thing that stands out <laughs> is, of course, they've got wings, which most normal warriors do not have. So even those things, and there are many of them in Greek, which we might regard as things that just happen to us, states we happen to be in, things we feel, fear, love, they are also very heavily anthropomorphized in Greek. And I'm convinced that this will have an effect on the way Greek philosophy conceives of divinity later on. Human divine interactions. That's primarily what we're going to be focusing on in the rest of this lecture. And I did manage to find a representation of the, let's call it marriage, between the goddess Aphrodite, goddess whose portfolio is largely love, the erotic, the sexual, and the Trojan prince, Anchises, who of course as you know, is the father of Aeneas, who will become the future founder of the Roman line of descent in another mythology. Well, we know it's a marriage because, of course, we have the marriage torch, and this figure, which I'm afraid is very, very difficult to see, is actually the god Eros. So these are bits of iconography that usually attend upon um, these kinds of scenes. And the goddess Aphrodite, suitably, is partially naked, as she often is represented in... Um, uh, depictions of this period. Um, this vessel itself, by the way, is a so-called lekuthos. It's a vessel for holding expensive perfumed oil. And it's a vessel particularly associated, in fact, with marriages. So it's an appropriate vessel with an appropriate depiction on it. But I'm more interested at the moment in a early poem. It's the so-called hymn to Aphrodite, which has been uh, transmitted to us under the authorship of Homer, though not in fact by Homer. And it reels some very interesting things about the way the gods are imagined, particularly when they interact with humans. And how else are we as human beings to really get to grips with them unless they do interact with us? So, Aphrodite has been, in effect, forced by Zeus to fall in love with the mortal, Anchises. And when she comes to Anchises, he's alone in the sheep pens um, on the farm, and she appears to him, this beautiful woman, he says, Greetings, my lady, whichever you are of the blessed who come here visiting, Artemis, Leto, perhaps Aphrodite the Golden, Themis of aristocratic descent, or Athena the Grey-Eyed, 
It's an American translation. Or are you one of the graces come here on a visit? The graces who are companions of all of the gods and are reckoned immortal. One of those nymphs are you, rather, frequenters of beautiful thickets. Or are you one of the nymphs that inhabit this beautiful mountain, maidens who dwell on the sources of rivers and haunt grassy meadows? Well, (laughs) he doesn't know. He doesn't know who this goddess is. He seems to assume she is a goddess. He was right, of course, with his third option. (laughs) But he didn't stop there because he had no idea. Clearly then she wasn't accompanied by her usual iconography, we might say. Noblest of men, she replies to him, who are born on the face of the earth, wise Anchises, I am no goddess. Well, there's another piece of information that we can learn from this, can't we? The gods lie. And they seem to lie a lot. So why do you liken me to the immortals? For I was born but to die. Oh, she's really rubbing it in, isn't she? I mean, it's horrible a goddess saying that. And the mother who bore me was mortal. Well, in many accounts, depends which account you take. In one account, she has no mother, does she? She's born out of the castrated testicles isn't she, of the god of heaven, Uranus. Mm. So there are lots of lies piling up here, but of course, as you know about lies, lies are good when you have detail, and therefore, she provides detail. Otreus is father's name, and a famous one. Maybe you've heard of it. He is the overlord of all Phrygia, fortified strongly. (laughs) Both of our, how do I speak your language? Because Phrygian is different from Trojan. Both of our languages, yours and my own, can I comprehend clearly, seeing that my nanny at home was a Trojan, who nursed me and raised me, taking me, my dear mother, when I was no more than a baby. Now, This is not just circumstantial detail. I I think these texts provide an enormous amount of insight into how the Greeks conceive of their gods. The gods lie, yes, but look at the way she's lying. She's lying as a good, clever, cunning human would lie. Maybe even better. They do have sexual intercourse. He falls asleep. And then she wakes him. And notice the difference. Rise, son of Dardanos. Why are you sleeping asleep without waking? That's the kind of thing God say. Why do you stand there looking up into the heaven? It's the kind of question you find recurring in many religious texts. This challenge that the gods make. It's almost derogatory. It's, tell me, do I now appear in your eyes at all similar to the woman that I first appeared to be when you beheld me and knew me? Such was her sleep speech. In his sleep he immediately heard and awakened, but when he saw the corsage and the beautiful eyes of the goddess, her eyes are different now. Terrified then, he averted his gaze, turned aside from her presence, hiding his beautiful face in the folds of the blanket again. He spoke as a supplicant, using swift words that flew straight to their targets. Goddess, the moment I saw you the first time, I knew that you were a goddess, but you did not tell me the truth. On my knees I beseech you, by Father Zeus, who wields the tempestuous buckler of the goatskin, that's the aegis, do not condemn me to dwell among men for the rest of my lifetime, impotent. Pity my manhood. For never a vigorous man, sorry, never a vigorous man is he any more in his lifetime who lies with an immortal goddess. Yeah. But, it, but she's kind of nice to him. Oh, sorry, it comes from the Homeric, so-called Homeric hymn to Aphrodite. Um, it's, um, there are many translations available. If any of you know the wonderful Lerb collection, um, the green and reds, green for Greek, red for... Um, for for Latin, with the Greek on one side and English translation on the other. It's in the collection with Hesiod. And it comes from a tablet or something? It comes from manuscripts which came down through the medieval period. So, um, along with the Homeric poems and everything else. There's a continuous line of transmission from antiquity in this particular case. We will be looking at some texts uh, in the future, lectures that did not come down that way, that we only have from papyrus. We will be looking at some of those, and from inscriptions as well. All right, so then if gods are very much like humans, and there are so many of them, you saw how even in that particular episode, Anchises just couldn't really work out, you know, who am I actually talking to here? We might think that this is somewhat chaotic. How are humans to grasp these? 
Now, if we look carefully at the various depictions of the Greek gods, we can sort of come up ourselves with certain polarities which seem to give some sort of structure. The polarities are sky and earth. So we talk about Olympian deities, a deities associated with the sky, Mount Olympus and the upper heavens. We talk about the chthonic, the gods that are associated with the area beneath the, beneath the earth in particular. Um, we talk about right and left. We talk about the auspicious and the inauspicious, which are connected to right and left, male and female. These categories, by the way, I've drawn them in these lines, in these columns, because quite often the associations seem to be bundled together in some way. The feminine is more often inauspicious and associated with the left-hand side, the male with the auspicious and the right-hand side, etc., etc. As humans, then, we are somewhat more liminal creatures. We... We inhabit the Earth's surface. We don't, are not above or, or below. That's where human and mortals are. We have to interact with one another with this wonderful thing that the Greeks call our day, our voice, our human voice, and the language that is articulated through this voice. And we, at best, can aspire not to divinity, but to a particular kind of excellence or prowess. And there are various environments in which that prowess or excellence can be displayed. It can be displayed on the battlefield, but it can also be displayed in the um, athletic arena, as it were, in public life, in various ways. Even as a craftsman, you can express your excellence and the, the beauty of the, the pottery you create, for example. So structural chaos. A key text here, which we don't have time to go into in any depth, I'm afraid, is the Theogony of the poet Hesiod. And we can date that very roughly, very, very roughly, to about 700 BC. Hesiod is often made more or less contemporary with the Homeric poems. And in that great poem, it's not a very long poem, but it's a great poem, we find the world conceived of as a divine procreative process. The world is not created by gods in Greek mythology or Greek religion. The world comes into being through the gods themselves coming into being. At first there is just chaos, chaos, which is a simply a big yawning hole. And out of that we have Gaia, the earth, Uranos, the heaven, Eros, the god of sexual love and reproduction. And from those basic entities, then, we have a process of procreation. So things come into being as divinities. How many gods are there? We cannot count them. Even Hesiod doesn't try to count them. You can count all the gods that he names and all the gods he mentions, and you end up with several hundred. But even Hesiod says you can't count them. He says, in fact, that there are on the earth three times uncountable gods. <laughs> he uses a, a word in Greek which means uncountable. So he's saying you can't count them. But what we do know then, as Pindar suspected, as we saw in that very first passage, that what we have is really a divine extended family. The gods are all ultimately related, maybe distantly, but they're all related to one another. And again, that I think has a particular effect on how the Greeks and later philosophers are going to look at the concept of divinity. The divinities then, except in some very, very minor ways, are not, they're not sort of artisans. They're not, they're not manufacturers of the world or things. They are the things themselves. And Zeus, who is the current and possibly the one who's always going to be there, um, chief god, although there were others before him, is very often titled the father of gods and men. And again, I think that's a very, very important epithet that we find in traditional poetry. It tells you something about him. So it's probably misleading to think of him primarily as a king or a chieftain. He is rather more a father figure, a patriarchal figure. So you can, as some have conceived of it as a sort of a, a pyramid-type structure with Zeus at the top, but another way to look at it would be Zeus sort of in the middle and people coming to him with their problems. People coming to him with a desire to settle disputes and issues. So Zeus very often has this kind of umpire um, role. 
which is not necessarily completely unlike a chieftain's role, but is more like the head of a very large extended family. I so often tell the students, he reminds me more, I don't know if any of you saw The, the Sopranos, that um, television series about the Italian crime family. He reminds me very much of Tony Soprano, you know. It's, it's got all these sort of family members and people in the extended family causing problems and he's got to sort of sort things out. All members, or many members of this extended family, occupy domains. So traditionally, we're often told that Zeus has the domain of the sky and the upper air. Poseidon has the sea and the oceans. And Hades, his other brother, has the underworld. So we have domains. But we also have, within that, various niches we might talk about. And on top of that, very often what we identify perhaps as portfolios, areas of influence and expertise. The Greek terms for this are many. I've selected two, um, geras and time. Both of these words are associated particularly with concrete, material ways in which um, your status is recognized. So they are symbolic but material at the same time. So very much we see the status of the gods acknowledged and recognized here. And we have therefore, as one scholar has described them, probably the best we can hope for, clusters of coherent functions. So Hera, the sister and wife of Zeus, often presides over married women business in Greek communities. Artemis, the virgin goddess, goddess of hunting in the wild, but also a goddess associated particularly with young virgins, particularly girls when they're transitioning from um, maidenhood through to marriage. Um, and also, interestingly, with childbirth, particularly the first child. So Artemis associated with those issues, those human issues. But Zidon, obviously, he's the earth shaker, earthquakes, tsunamis, the sea, Apollo, various portfolios, music, healing, disease, prophecy, Zeus, a lot of weather, largely weather. All right, just a few more things then to talk about with the gods, their voices, their physical appearance, their food and drink, their habitation, and then some supernatural. Can't really spend too much time on these passages. They're interesting. Um, this one I've selected uh, from the Odyssey, and it it indicates something that scholars suspect, and there is some evidence for it, that the Greeks believe that the gods actually speak their own language, and they have a different kind of voice from human voices. Obviously, they speak largely in our voices when they interact with us, and when they represent it, obviously, you know, you have to represent them talking in a language that we understand. But there are little hints. There's this nice little piece from the Odyssey where um, Odysseus wakes up on Scaria, the island of the Phaeacians, and he doesn't know where he is. And the first thing he hears is this awful ayute, this um, female cry. All translations, by the way, of Homer, I've used um, these two wonderful translations by my colleague Richard Whitaker. They're two sort of South African, South African English translations, the Odyssey and the Iliad. So this is different, it would seem, from the kind of speech that humans have. Notice that phrase, aude entes, and I used that word auda for human voice a bit earlier on, auda entes, anthropoi auda entes, humans that speak as humans do, versus this particular kind of sound which is not really human. Then again, also in the Odyssey, Book 5, when Odysseus is rescued by the goddess Leucothea, and we're told that Actually, her name, when she was immortal, was Aino. She was mortal once, noticed with a human voice. Brotos adeessa. There's that word again. So we're getting a recurrent formulaic um, way of talking about human speech, and a way also where human speech, if you like, identifies you as human. But now an honored goddess of the deep, we're told. She's different. And so, actually, her name has changed. Her name has also changed. Uh, it means sort of white goddess, it would seem, yeah, exactly, yeah. 
This reminds me very much, and you can see the pattern here, can't you, the way Odysseus speaks to the mortal woman, the young mortal girl, Nausicaa, when he arrives on Scaria in book six of the Odyssey. He says to her when he first meets her, when she comes to him, I beg you, lady, are you God or mortal? If one of the gods who live in heaven, I think you very like great, great Zeus's daughter, Artemis. Good choice, of course, Artemis, virgin, chaste, etc. In beauty, in form, and stature. But if a mortal girl who lives on earth, <laughs> hedging his bets, three times blessed your father and lady mother, three times blessed your brothers. An entirely appropriate sort of interaction from Odysseus. Very, very well behaved, very polite. Food for the gods. I love this little scene where Calypso is being told by Zeus via the god, messenger god Hermes, that she has to let Odysseus go from her island. She can't keep him indefinitely. It's, it's, it's a great holiday, but no, nope, she's got to let him go. And she's very, very cross, understandably, but she does, notice, behave as humans would. She hosts Hermes. So saying, she placed next to him, Hermes, a table full of ambrosia. So the gods eat, but very often they eat a different food from us. They eat a food that looks very much like um, the absence of what makes us what we are. Because one of the words in Greek for a, a human, a mortal, is a brotos. And ambrosia looks very much like a negation of the notion of brot. Because that's, they are connected, it would seem. And they also drink something different, nectar, don't they? So that's what he eats and drinks when he's having, um, having a snack provided by Calypso. In the very same book... After Hermes has left, Calypso, I love this bit, it really is like table for two. Calypso takes Odysseus back to her place, to her cave, and she, God and man, they came to the hollow cave. He sat down on the chair, sorry, where, where Hermes sat, and the nymph set by him food of every kind to eat and drink, such as mortal men, Brotoi Andres, consume. So that's what he eats. She, ate, she sat opposite godlike Odysseus. So notice the epithet recognizes him, the typical formulaic way, as godlike, but he's not a god, and made set by her nectar and ambrosia. And they both eat. So they eat different food. Those of you familiar with the story will also be familiar with the fact that, in fact, Calypso offers him this immortal food because it will make him immortal. But he says, no thanks, I, I have a wife to get back to, which is very decent of him. Habitation of the gods, yes. They don't all live on Mount Olympus, but when Mount Olympus is mentioned, it's mentioned as something that is very unlike anything we as humans can experience, though we can imagine it. It's their unshaken home, battered by no winds, not wet with rain or snow, cloudless ether stretched above, dazzling brightness all around. And here the gods take pleasure all their days. To ini terpontai makares theoi emata panta. Again, that's an image that we need to remember because it's an image that will come back to haunt us in ancient Greek philosophical concepts. Because the concepts I'm showing you here, of course, are, are quite complex, aren't they? They involve gods behaving very much like humans, having the same sorts of busy lives that humans have. At the same time, in tension with that, we have this representation of the habitation of the gods being very, very different, very peaceful, where there is no wind, where there is no weather. What can gods do? Well, I haven't got time, of course, to go into all of that. But again, if we're restricting ourselves to these small texts and just sort of looking at a few selections, one of the things they can do is, is sort of move around without us seeing them. Odysseus is talking to the Phaeacians here, and he's talking about how he was on the island of Circe, Kirke, in Greek. And at one occasion he says that she slipped easily by us, and he makes this interesting comment, should a god not wish it, who could glimpse her as she comes and goes? One of my favorites is when Apollo taunts Achilles. Apollo, this is in the Iliad, Apollo has been disguised as the hero Agenor, 
and Achilles has been chasing him around, trying to kill him. And Apollo, one last, finally turns around and says, Son of Peleus, why chase me on quick feet? You are a mortal. Me, an immortal god. Theon Ambroton. Remember Ambrosia? Not seeing I am a god, you relentlessly persist. <coughs> Some extravagant claims are made for gods. Menelaus in Book 4 encounters a goddess named Edotheia. And again, notice the formulaic way in which gods and humans, or humans interact with gods. He says, I tell you, whichever goddess you may be, because I don't know, that I do not choose to stay here, but have surely sinned against the gods who live in heaven. Please tell me, for the gods know everything. This is a phrase that comes up again and again. Panta issa sin. The gods know everything. Tell me which immortal binds me and prevents me from returning home. Uh, I'm going to skip that one and go to this one. Odysseus, talking about how he was effectively given this magic plant called Molly by the gods so that he wouldn't get changed into a pig like his other companions by the goddess Circe. And he says, though easy for the gods, mortal men can hardly dig it up. And then Richard actually missed this line that I'm including it now. But the gods, after all, can do anything. Pantadunatai. Even in very, very mediocre circumstances, people may say something like this. The wonderful old swineherd Eumaeus, this faithful farm worker who's been loyal to Odysseus all the time that he's away, he doesn't know that Odysseus, who's in disguise as a beggar, is now home. And he entertains him in the small, meager way he can. And he says, eat, strange guest, and such as it is, enjoy this food. The god who is all-powerful will or will not give you what he pleases. For he can do everything, Dunatai Gai Panta. So it's a common, it's a common uh, theme. Well, yes, there are things they can do. They can change themselves easily. This lovely thing where Athena, when Odysseus arrives home, she takes on the form of a shepherd, a particularly fine, beautiful shepherd. <laughs> but even a few lines later, she's something else. The grey-eyed goddess Athene smiled and stroked him with a hand. I love the intimacy of that gesture goddess to mortal man looking like a woman, tall, beautiful and skilled in lovely crafts and Odysseus at one point in that same conversation said it's hard goddess for even a wise man to recognize you, you have so many shapes yes the gods do have so many shapes and the gods can even transform us, Athena transforms Odysseus in book 13 into something completely unlike his own heroic self to translate, to makes him, transforms him into this, um, basically a berchi, an old, wrinkled berchi, and dresses him appropriately. But can they do anything? And we return to the case of Sarpedon. In book 16 of the Iliad, um, Zeus is confronted, you might think, by something of a dilemma. His beloved son, Sarpedon, is going to be killed by Achilles' friend, Patroclus. And he entertains the idea of actually rescuing Sarpedon, of bringing him out of that environment, taking him and rescuing him and saving him from death. And it's his wife, Hera, who addresses Zeus. This is Hera, his wife, talking. And she says, Dread son of Kronos, what a thing to say. Do you wish to free from dreadful death a mortal man, destined long ago by fate, the word used there is Isaiah, who herself in um, Hesiod is also a goddess? Do so. We other gods will not approve. So here, of course, it looks as if he can do it, even though it's fated by Isaiah that Sarpedon will die at this time. But take to heart this other thing I say. If you should send Sarpedon home alive, then some other god may want to send his son, too, away from the battle surge. For round Priam's widespread town are fighting many sons of gods whom you will greatly anger. There are consequences. And Zeus, of course, is aware of consequences and takes heed of them. She spoke, the father of gods and men obeyed. 
He sent down to the ground a bloody rain, honouring his son, whom Patroclus would kill in fertile Troy, far from his native land. It's a very, very poignant scene in the Iliad. So, yes, perhaps the gods are imagined to be able to do anything they like, but what's interesting is that they don't. In a work which is rather more self-consciously, if we might use the term inappropriately, theological, like Hesiod's Works and Days, which is very, very, very anxious to show that human wrongdoing has a consequence, and it's a consequence that is, in a sense, endorsed by divinity. In the very beginning of this poem, Hesiod addresses the muses and he says come tell of your father Zeus and sing his hymn through whom each man is famous or unknown talked of or left obscure through his great will with ease he strengthens any man with ease he makes the strong man humble and with ease withers the proud and makes the crooked straight with ease the thunderer whose home is high hear Zeus and set our fallen laws upright and may my song for Perseus tell the truth. Perseus is Hesiod's brother, and Perseus seems to have cheated Hesiod out of some sort of inheritance or something. So it's kind of personal. That's quite a trivial event, isn't it, in, in cosmic terms? But Hesiod seems convinced that even that trivial sort of little personal issue that he has with his brother is somehow relevant to Zeus. Zeus takes an interest even in those trivial things. So Zeus is being given an awful lot here. Uh, People speak, and there's in fact the entire books written on the subject of the justice of Zeus. Again, that's an issue that we were returning to. Zeus himself, on the other hand, in the Odyssey, says, at least as depicted by Homer, <laughs> that actually people blame the gods for everything that happens. And you might think that what he had said in the previous quotation would suggest that. But in this particular text, it's claimed by Zeus himself that that's not the case. He says, as you can see there, if we take the example of the murder of Agamemnon by Aegisthus and the wooing of Clytemestra by Aegisthus, he says, actually this was not something that was his portion. The crucial, whoops, sorry, the crucial um, phrase there, by the way, is, sounds like a very rude term for a person who's very, very stupid, a hypermoron, but <laughs> hypermoron means over and above your portion. So the notion is that human beings do have a portion, and the portion is, of course, a portion of good, a portion of suffering, and your portion has bits and pieces of it in there. And that is given to you. That's not, that's not denied. But that we're not talking about some form of hard determinism here. It's a sort of a more of a soft -dish kind of determinism because people are capable of making things worse for themselves, as he just did by ignoring the warnings not to kill Agamemnon and commit adultery with Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra. So actually it's their own blind folly. That is a quite a difficult one. I mean, the, um, the, the terms... I've seen translations in this particular passage, for example, it's a good question, in book 23 of the Odyssey, after Odysseus has killed all the suitors in this household and a good number of other people besides, um, and the nurse goes and tells his wife, who doesn't know that Odysseus is back yet, what's happened. The nurse says, sorry, the Penelope, Odysseus's wife says to the nurse, Mama, it's too soon for laughter and big talk. You know that his return, Odysseus's return, would bring us joy, me above all, as well as the son we bore. But this story you tell is just not true. Some god must have killed the arrogant suitors, angered by their bitter violence. And the word used there is the translation for bitter violence is hubris and crimes. I've seen other translations where people have used the term sins, for example. The Greek term that both of those translations are trying to uh, grasp is simply kaka erga, which means bad deeds. So the question then of whether we can regard these as sins is, of course, perhaps one that we need to revisit. But 
what's, what's clear is that there's a belief held by Penelope and presumably other people as well that gods will intervene of their own accord, that it's the gods who are immediately responsible and have been activated against the suitors because of these two bad things that the suitors have displayed, which is very interesting. We see that word, oops, atastalia again as well. Um, sorry, I've just lost this. Backwards, so <laughs> yeah, um, might I remember from a, from a previous slide that term, which is sorry, right at the bottom there, is again a recurring term. It occurred in Zeus's de um, description of why human beings get suffering over and above what their portion is. It's their recklessness. Um, I would prefer perhaps to translate this as. They've suffered for their recklessness rather than simply deeds, which is what Richard has, has chosen there in this poetic translation. We're coming to the end. What I want to very finish off very, very quickly with is something about experts and authorities, because I think this um, will help us transition quite nicely into tomorrow's lecture. Because we've had you know, some sort of little insights now about the nature of the gods. I know that those are very much incomplete, but they've given us some idea. Who knows this stuff? Well, if we look at these ancient texts, what emerges is that there are people who might lay special claim to some sort of special insight or knowledge. Let's call them experts or authorities. We have, on the one level, priests. But funnily enough, these don't actually feature very, very prominently in most of the early texts. It's partially, I think, because priests in ancient Greek religion in the archaic period are very often individuals who um, serve as a priest as a kind of public office. In other words, they're not professionals in any sort of sense. It's not a vocation. Uh, it's not even necessarily a particular kind of expertise, theological expertise, certainly not. It's a, an awareness, a knowledge of what to do when at particular times of the calendar, the religious calendar. And very often people served as priests for a limited time, sometimes for a year, sometimes depending on the, the place and the kind of priesthood, for two or three years. There is some evidence for some uh, clans or tribes or families that had a, an inherited priesthood. But I think it's quite different from what we might, in, and certainly in modern 21st century terms, think of as a priesthood. So quite often we're not talking about theological expertise lying in the priesthood. What we do find are people that are more difficult to actually categorize, the so-called mantes. That term is often translated as seers, prophets, soothsayers, uh, oinopoloi, in other terms, sort of bird watchers, as it were. Um, and also, interestingly, we mustn't discount singers. Um, one of the terms used are the oidoi, the people who, in fact, sing the songs that Homer sings, or Hesiod sings. And then, although I'm not going to talk about these various oracular centers like Delphi, Dodona, Diduma in Asia Minor, they become centers which are regarded as having some kind of authority. Whether it's, sexually, whether it's theological authority, though, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to say. Just as close with a couple of examples. And you can see how sort of, I don't know, not quite superficial, but, but certainly how... Um, it's not particularly institutionalized, let's put it that way. So the famous prophet of the Iliad is Calchas. Um, I'm using Richard's translation, I rather like it. Thestor's son, that's Calchas. Best of all Sangomas, uh, as, as uh, rather nicely Richard renders this, this term, oionopoloi, which is a, a person who specializes in birds, who knew the present, the future, and the past. Now he... In this instance, in the Iliad Book 2, he, um, the Greek camp has been afflicted by a terrible plague. People have been dying in enormous numbers. And it's actually Apollo, we learn. It's Apollo who's caused it. And Apollo's caused that because he's angry, be because his priest, um, the, the daughter of his priest, has been taken by Agamemnon. And he, Calchas tells Agamemnon this. And this is how Agamemnon responds. 
prophet, he says, of evil, Mantis, prophet of evil, never any help to me. You love to prophesy bad things, but not once say or do a thing that's good. Now you declare the God's will to the Achaeans. The archer brings disaster on them because I'd not take ransom for the girl, Chryseis, whom I wish to keep at home. Right, that's the content. But I, I find his reaction interesting. That's something similar in the Odyssey as well. Also in Book 2, funnily enough, Book 2 of the Odyssey, there's a big discussion being had by the people of the island of Ithaca as to what should be done about Odysseus's home because the suitors are flocking there and consuming all his goods. And Telemachus says, look, I can't cope anymore. These people are eating me out of house and home. We've got to get rid of them. Now, they've been having this discussion. And suddenly, we're told, up above, far-seeing Zeus made two eagles fly from a mountain peak for a time. They rode the currents of air next to one another, wings outstretched. But as they flew about the speakler's hotler, they rapidly beat their wings and whirled about. And right above the men's heads, eyes flashing doom, their talons tore at one another's cheeks and throat as they sped eastward over the town and houses. All stared at the birds amazed, wondering in their hearts what future thing this meant. Like me. I've no idea what that means. I wouldn't assume it means anything, necessarily, unless I were told, as we are here, and this is the narrator telling us, that far-seeing Zeus made them do this. Otherwise, just two birds, isn't it? Two eagles fighting. So, then the old hero Halitherses spoke, Mastor's son, who more than all his age group knew birds and could interpret their behavior. That's all. That's all we're told about his claim to authority. And just to summarize, basically he says, look, these birds, it indicates Odysseus will be home soon. I don't know how he got that from the birds, but never mind. The suitor's outrageous behavior must stop. And what I predicted long ago is now coming true. Now look at the reaction by one of the suitors. <coughs> Go home, Ketla, and play the Sangoma to your children so they stay free from harm. And my prophecy is better than yours. Of all the birds that fly about beneath the sun's rays, only some have meaning. Odysseus is far away. He's dead. I wish you'd died with him. <laughs> you'd stop this talk of omens. You'd not stir Telemachus, remember he's Odysseus's son, to anger, hoping he'll make a rich gift to your homestead. So already there we're seeing, aren't we, the possibility of a voice which does not unquestionably take for granted if a particular person says, oh, by the way, I know how to interpret the signs of birds. It's not institutionalized in the way we might expect. And finally, the singer, the haunt of the muses, Mount Helicon. And I mention this because, of course, the poets, the singers, lay claim to this authority as well. One of my favorite pieces from the beginning of the Theogony, or near the beginning, we're told there, of a particular incident that happened in Hesiod's life. There he was, just simply shepherding his lambs on holy Helicon, <laughs> when the goddesses, who are muses, daughters of Zeus, said, you rustic shepherds, shame, bellies you are, not men. We know enough to make up lies which are convincing, but we also have the skill when we've a mind to speak the truth. So spoke the fresh-voiced daughters of great Zeus, and plucked and gave a staff to me, a shoot of blooming laurel, wonderful to see, and breathed a sacred voice into my mouth, with which to celebrate the things to come and things which were before. They ordered me to sing the race of blessed ones who live forever, and to him the muses first, and at the end. No more delays. Begin. Now, I find that a very interesting passage, because... As a normal 21st century human, I want to ask, what guarantees do I have of Hesiod's authority? Hesiod's provided us with an anecdote. Um, and the anecdote tells us that the goddesses appeared to me when I was on the mountainside. No witnesses are provided for this event. And they gave me the power to sing. And of course, presumably, the knowledge that accompanies that power. They gave me an outward symbol, a stick that comes from a bay tree. I have bay tree in my garden. I mean, I could bring that in now and claim, couldn't I, the muses of that. So although we have the outward symbols and we have the, um, the assertion, we don't really have anything else. The one thing we might have, just to close on this, and that might be Hesiod's own proficiency. 
he see its own remarkable ability to sing in the way he does with su in such a competent way. Perhaps that is the only, if you like, guarantee or testimony to the truth of what he claims and gives him the authority that he, that he wants you to ha think he has. But that will become the problem. If we are to make claims about what the gods are like, what authority do we do that? How do we claim that? Thanks very much. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the timing right, but there is some, we make some time for questions. I'll get it better next uh, tomorrow. Thanks. Um, that, that's moving way beyond my, my own sort of area of, of expertise. Um, and maybe some people in the audience might, might know a little bit more about this. Um, I, I'm, I'm dimly aware of, of research that indicates that, that in um, a place like, certainly in, 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 in modern Greece, but of course there are other places as well, which would be relevant. But in, in, in modern Greece, with, with Orthodox Greek religion, that, that quite often there are perhaps... Um, localities which and and maybe even cults of various kinds which are superimposed upon perhaps earlier localities where we had perhaps pagan pagan religion so in other words and you would expect that i suppose the superseding of a particular religious site by a a, a new religion in the case say of christianity of orthodox christianity um, and although i haven't done any reading on this, I, I, sus I suspect there are people who have tried to find, or maybe have found, traces of earlier pagan cults somehow buried within um, the, the cultic practice of, of some localities. Um, that's possible. But to my knowledge, there's no organized entity, unless it's being resuscitated by sort of pagan movements. I gather that, that pagan movements are, are um, you know, are kind of are fashionable. Um, um, over the last few decades. So it is possible that, that, that people um, individually, uh, spontaneously are, are, are resuscitating certain things. It is possible. I don't know if anyone else knows more about that. in with um, Egyptian theology here. Is there anything that comes in here? There's a lot of research that's been done on that. And, and, and um, again, that's had its ups and downs. It, it used to be, uh, back in the, 80, the 17th and 18th century, yeah. that, was a, that was a standard view, um, that, that Greek religion owed an awful lot to... to religion. So, as, 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 yes, that's right. And, and that's still... Uh, 